Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video in our introduction to the finite element method in which we are going to be continuing talking about the isoparametric formulation. Now this is basically a part of a multi-parter course in the finite element method that I will be linking on the top right and this is the second part of the isoparametric formulation in which we are going to continue talking about just that. Notice that isoparametric formulation is a very important uh, topic and you might have to double check the previous video again, which I will be linking once again on top right, before continuing in this video. In this video, we are going to continue appreciating the isoparametric formulation and trying to understand how this thing works. So with that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Now to recap very quickly, I have a real element and I somehow project and back project the real element to a fantasy or perfect element, it's called the isoparametric element, but I'll just call it the fantasy or perfect element. And this projection happens because we have scaling in S, scaling in T, scaling in ST, and some constant shifting, which basically means that the center of that element is going to be shifted from the zero, zero. You can see this on those things here, and I've explained this in a previous video. We know that x is a function in s and t, and y is a function in s and t, which we also, and also we know that u and v are functions of s and t. Now, there are some questions that are remaining from last time I have not yet addressed, and I want to address part of them and leave some others for next times. So, as for question one, like, how is it even possible that we have the same equations for both u and x, as well as y and v, the reason behind that is because each node has two properties or coordinates and each node has two, two degrees of freedom. And since the number of coordinates and the number of degrees of freedom are the same, I can use the same functions to approximate both. The second question that might come into mind is, okay, can we have an element where the degrees of freedom are more than the coordinates? And the answer is yes, you can. And this is in the bending plates. And in a bending plate, you would have an element like this. This is in 3D now. The element could rotate around the y-axis. It could rotate around the x-axis, and it could just go down. So you have three degrees of freedom per each node. And you, of course, you have only two coordinates. In that case, there is some really, really heavy mathematics happening there. And you can see uh, papers of the DKMT by Dr. Cartley, 1993 or something where he explains how you can basically find that. But spoiler, it is really complicated. Now, before I continue, I had a question from our dear subscriber and channel member, Donald Khanie, asking about if there is a perfect triangle. And yes, there exists one. And there are two versions of that, or actually multiple versions. One of them is a right angle triangle starting at zero, ending at one here and at one here. And I think there was another one. I forgot how it looked. I think it was something like this, but I think this is less. Uh, I think this is less famous. So there are multiple standard triangles because you can change the shape of the triangle and assume it to be the standard triangle. Because I mean, for a quadrilateral, that's very easy. A square is a perfect quadrilateral. But for triangles, you have multiple versions. I think DKMT, if I remember correctly, uses this version. I forgot to be honest, but as I said, uh, there is a perfect triangle, and you have to basically project your stuff into the perfect triangle. And of course, this is something that I might be explaining in the, in the future, but that's not part of the isoparametric formulation. Also, also in the DKMT, this is a bending element, so it has totally different degrees of freedom than this element. This element is a plate element, meaning that you have tension and compression on both sides as well as shear, and you don't have bending moments. So that's a small difference. I hope this makes sense. Now, now something I want to mention is very quickly is that you see the book Daryl L. Logan uses the word shape somehow ambiguously because the word shape is used to describe uh, the relationship between the real shape and the hypothetical perfect shape. And the word shape is also used for shape functions. So I will try to refer to the actual shape as geometry and to the shape functions as mixing or interpolation functions, if I remember that. I'm not sure I will always remember, but I just want to tell you the nuance of that, that this might be ambiguous to use because shape could refer to shape functions, which are the mixing or interpolation functions. 
and also could refer to the sh actual shape or form of the element. So this is a problem that you might face when you read the book Daryl and Logan. Not to say that it's a bad book, it's actually really, really good, but that's worth mentioning. What is next, right? So we want, what's our objective? Our objective is to find the stiffness K. Now to find the stiffness K, there are a lot of steps to follow. And if you have been following those lectures, you know that one of the steps is, well, to find the strains. You see, I actually listed those. Our mission objective, if you choose to accept it, is to calculate the, the stiffness matrix. And how do we do that? Well, there is some inter integration magic that is going to happen. This needs us to find the strains for integration, which needs us to find or define the displacement functions. Now, defining the displacement functions is done because I have u and note it's as a function of s and t. So you see, there's a problem now. And then I'm going to explain what the problem is. Let's, internal let's internalize this first before I go on with the problem. To internalize, x is a function in s and t, y is a function in s and t, u is a function in s and t, and v is a function in s and t. If you don't believe me, well, there you go. Since we are deriving the stiffness matrix of the real element, we need the strains of the real element. Now, the real element is an x and y, and to find the strains in x and y, I need to derive or partial derive the displacements with regard to x and with regard to y. Now, this is not easy because u is a function of s and t. So how can I derive u with respect to x? You would think, well, that's easy. u is a function of s and t, and, and then you realize that you cannot continue because s is not a function in x. No, it's actually quite the opposite. x is a function in s. So this way of thought doesn't work. Now, how can we do this? Well, to do this, we are going to use a chain rule, but I will explain this in a moment because I need to prepare for that. So instead of saying u and v and so on, let's just use a generic function f. So we have a function f that is a function of s and t. Now this f could be the u, it could be the v, it could be anything. So it's a generic term. Now the, func the function here is a function of s and t, but s in turn is not a function in x, quite, uh, quite the opposite. x is a function in s. So how can I find partial the function to partial x as an example? Um, so we are going to use a chain rule very, in a very strange way. So what do I mean by strange? You see, we are going to derive the chain rule for partial f to partial s. This is really strange, because in reality, I do not need the chain rule to find that. Like, and this is something that takes time to internalize in Daria Logan's, uh, Logan's book. When you reach this point, if you are a student of the finite element method at the moment in the semester, when you reach that point here, it's a break or make point for you. So I will make it become a make point for you instead of a break point for you. So allow me to explain this to you. You see, the book tries to perform the chain rule to evaluate partial f to partial s, s. Now this seems to be ridiculous because you don't need the chain rule for that. I mean, look, this is the function u, right? The function u is a function in s and a function in t. So if you want to find partial u to partial s, you don't need the chain rule for that, right? Because I mean, look, you can easily derive that. This is zero, this is a1, or sorry, a2, this is zero, and that's a4t. So you can easily find the partial derivative of u with respect to s, without the use of any chain rule. So what gives? Why is Daryl L. Logan suggesting to use the chain rule to find the partial derivative of f with regard to s, although I can't directly do so? Well, the reason is because we are going to use the chain rule actually not to find this. This, as you have seen just before, can be found directly. So the chain rule's goal, paradoxically, is not to evaluate this. No, no, no. This can be easily evaluated. The goal of the chain rule is to evaluate something else in a sneaky way. So first of all, the chain rule is a well-known phenomenon in calculus. Partial derivative f to s is f to x, x to s, and f to y, y to s. That's a well-known chain rule for s. 
and the well-known chain rule 40. I'm not going to dispute that, nor am I going to explain the intricacies of the chain rule. This is something that you learn in calculus. What I want to explain is, why do I, why do I apply a more complicated way, i.e. the chain rule, to find something that I can readily find from here? Well, it is because this easy thing is not my target. You see, let's ask the following question. What are the things that I can evaluate easily and what are the things that I am trying to evaluate? The things in green are things I can easily evaluate because f is a function in s and t and x is a function in s and t and y is a function in s and t. Those are things I can easily evaluate. However, my mission objective is to find the evaluation of the function with respect to x and that is what I'm trying to use. You see, I'm using the chain rule to find this, not because I'm asking the question, what is partial f to s? No, no, no. I actually want to find that. Now, this are, those are two equations with two unknowns, and you know from Kramer's law or whatever, that this is actually the solution for each one of those. You can apply Kramer's rule or any rule for that regard. This is just an algebra, algebraic equation solution. So you see, it's not this what we want, it is this, and we need to solve for it. Now this is the solution, and let's take a look if we know those or not. You see, anything with respect to S and T is something I can easily obtain, which means yes, I can find partial F to partial Y, and partial F to partial X. And that's very important, because I want to calculate the strain for the real element, because I want to calculate the stiffness of the real element, and the real element is an x and y, so that's why I cannot simply say partial u to partial s. This doesn't work, because this would give you the strain in the s direction. This is for the imaginary element. However, I want for the real element, so I need the partial u to partial x in that case. Now, I can only find this using this sneaky idea and that is the make or break point of the isoparametric formulation. This is why uh, people somehow get confused here. So you might need to backpedal a little bit. I want to repeat this for one last time. Partial derivative u, for example, to s is something I can easily obtain. And I am going to use the chain rule anyway, because I, my goal is not to obtain the partial f to partial s, but actually obtain some side effects of the chain rule. That, those are my goal. The green things are something I easily can obtain, and the red things are things I want to try to obtain. Now you see, finally, this here is actually called the Jacobian. I mean, you, you can easily do that. Like this entire thing here is called the Jacobian matrix. And you can even like do some mathematic trick, for example. Um, for example here, considering this, uh, let's make a, instead of an f, let's make a placeholder function, just an empty space. So if you have partial whatever over partial x, it's partial whatever over partial s, and so on. Now this is a, this is a determinant, so you can multiply those two things minus those two things. So you can see here, uh, if you multiply the main diagonal here, you have partial y over partial t, multiplied by partial whatever over partial s, that is the main diagonal, and then you have to do the secondary diagonal with a negative, so a negative partial y over partial s, multiplied by partial whatever over partial t. This is basically the expansion of those matrices. There is nothing new here I want to add. Of course, here there's a Jacobian determinant, because this is a determinant, of course, and that's it. That's how I can find the derivative of anything with respect to x and y. Remember, we are doing this because I want to find the strains for the real element, so I need to find the partial derivative with respect to x and to y, and I had to do this big thing just to find that. Now, of course, you would think, but isn't this kind of odd? Isn't this something that increases the complexity? No. The reason why this is simpler is because your real because your hypothetical fantasy perfect element is actually much easier to be evaluated for derivative instead of going for the real element. And allow me to remind you of the linear strain triangle and all the horror that you had to do to derive the equations. 
I even was not able to do a full example with that because of its complexity, but I will still uh, add here a video that reminds you of that. Now we need an example for the isoparametric, but this will be part of maybe future videos. For now, I want to hold the following. I want to hold that this big equation can find the partial derivative of anything with respect to x, and the anything here is actually a function in s and t, but of course we use the chain rule smart and sneakily to find the partial to x. One thing to finalize the lecture here, and actually there are two things. First thing is that actually I will not be using u, but I will, using, I will be using shape functions, and by shape functions I mean the interpolation mixing functions. I have intentionally jumped over that section in the book and started with this, because I thought that I might be including this in the next time, and also because I want in the next time just go do our quick rundown of the Jacobian and so on, because that is a complicated matter, and I want to repeat that partially for the next two for the first two minutes in the next video. Anyway, uh, this means that our u is actually going to be shape function by ui, and those shape functions are functions in s and t which means I have to run them down in this partial whatever of a partial x. Now, of course, the question is, what is the meaning of the Jacobi matrix? Now, I'm not going to show you the mathematical meaning, because in the mathematical meaning, it just shows you partial x to partial s, partial y to partial s, just numbers. But let's think for a moment. Partial x to partial s means the change in x if s changes. It's like a scaling factor. Like, if x changes a lot when s changes, this might be a very longitudinal element where a movement in the fantasy s causes a huge movement in the real element. So it's like a scaling matrix. As a matter of fact, I was somehow not able to phrase that in good words. So I asked Bart to phrase that for me and Bart gave me this. And you can pause the video and read. And I really like the way Bart puts it. Like the only way I would think about this is to tell you that this is scaling because it tells you what, how does X change when S changes? That's a scale for you. And of course, scale goes for both ways, but the way Bard puts it is amazing. This is bard.google.com. Of course, our video is not sponsored by that, but I thought, hey, look at how nice IAIs are actually showing you data. I think this is enough for today. It was a mathematical rundown, I know, but it's a very necessary one. Usually I don't go into the mathematical rundowns and try to make them make sense to you, but this time this is something that is a necessary evil and I had to go through it. And well, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope that you enjoyed the video. And of course, before I finish, I want to give a partial of a partial T sized shout out to our dear channel members whose names are going to be shown on the screen in both the contributor level and the helper level. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart, as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos with a certain quality and hopefully on time, uh, and for that I am forever thankful. Of course, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have found it beneficial, please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, and so on, especially subscribing as a sacrifice to the YouTube algorithm overlords. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.